Good evening, and thanks for coming to our Indeed Eng Tech Talk tonight. This is Data Driven Off a Cliff, Anti-Patterns in Evidence Decision Making. My name is Tom Wilbur, and I'm a product manager at Indeed, and I help people get jobs. Indeed is the number one job site worldwide. We serve over 200 million monthly unique users in over 60 countries and in 29 languages. The place where most job seekers work with Indeed is here at the search results page. It's pretty simple. You put a few keywords in the what box, put a location in the where box, click the find jobs button, and you get back a ranked list of jobs that are relevant for you. Indeed is headquartered here in Austin, Texas, the capital of the Lone Star State. Austin and this fine building is our largest engineering office, though we also have engineering offices in Tokyo, San Francisco, Seattle, and Hyderabad. So we have smart engineers, tons of smart engineers, and great product teams working all over the world around the clock to build a better Indeed. This means we have tons of ideas. But we have tons of bad ideas. And occasionally, don't get me wrong, we, we, we do have good ideas, but it's hard to tell the difference. And what we really want to know is what helps people get jobs. We believe that the only reliable way to know is just to see what works. So at Indeed, we set up experiments. We run A-B tests on our site, randomly assigning our users to different experiences. We collect results. We observe our users' behavior, and our log repo system logs over six terabytes of new information every single day. We use this data to decide what to do, to determine which features and which capabilities help people get jobs and which don't. We've used this data to make good decisions, but having a ton of data is not a silver bullet because we've used this data to make bad decisions because the truth is science is hard. <laughs> one of the things, one challenge with science is that simply running an experiment can actually ruin the experiment itself. Let me tell you a little story about that. In the late 1920s, outside of Chicago, Illinois, there was an electric and telephone factory called the Hawthorne Works. The plant managers wanted to try to improve the output of the factory, so they decided to run some experiments, changing the workers' working conditions to see if it improved output. They changed the lighting, sometimes brighter, sometimes dimmer. They changed the temperature, sometimes warmer, sometimes cooler. They adjusted the length and frequency of breaks. And they were very excited because their initial test showed improvement in output of the factory. Brighter light, productivity is up. Dimmer light, productivity is up. Warmer, up. Cooler, up. Shorter breaks, longer breaks. Actually, everything they seemed to try seemed to improve worker productivity. And even worse, these improvements didn't stick. They just faded back, and they were back to where they started. Ultimately, the researchers concluded the actual act of running the experiment, of changing the conditions, observing the results, is what was affecting the workers' behavior. This effect is now commonly known as the Hawthorne effect. I see a lot of heads nodding in the audience because People who spend their lives optimizing websites know this one well. We know this story. When we see an example of a test that seems to be going well, we can't help but hear that voice that asks, is it real? Will it last? Or is it just the Hawthorne effect? Because science is hard. And if that wasn't enough, statistics are hard. There are lots of ways you can do a statistical analysis and get back confusing or even contradictory results. One example is Anscombe's Quartet. Francis Anscombe was a statistician in the 1970s that illustrated four different data sets, each containing 11 points. These sets all had the same statistical properties. They have the same mean, the same variance, the same correlation. And as you can see by the blue lines, they even have the same regression. Anscombe's Quartet shows us that just a statistical calculation is not sufficient to really understand our data, especially when there are outliers. 
Another challenge that comes with statistics is Simpson's paradox. Simpson's paradox is where a statistician went back in time with his toaster and began accidentally changing the past. He tried to fix it, but the more he did, the more the future changed. Then there were no donuts, people had lizard tongues, and that is no way to make data-driven decisions. I'm sorry, that was Homer Simpson's paradox from Treehouse of Horror 5. Sorry, Edwin Simpson's para paradox is very different. Edwin Simpson showed that sometimes small groups of data can actually tell a different story than the whole data group altogether. This illustration shows four groups of red dots and four of blue dots that each show a positive trend. But if you look at the overall trend of this data, it's negative with the black dotted sloping line. Now, imagine if you were looking at your software, at your site, and mobile revenue was going up, and desktop revenue was going up, but overall revenue was going down. Now what do you do? A situation like this usually means that the subtrends of the smaller amounts of data are in fact false. And the problem is that you actually don't understand the interdependencies and causality between the underlying data. Because statistics is hard. But using data well is of course more than just statistics. Good math paired with a bad idea can easily lead to a situation that can produce very regrettable results. And so these bad practices might undermine your good math. And you know, you don't need me to teach you how to be bad at math. But I'll teach you how to be bad at everything else. So tonight, we are going to share with you our powerful techniques for how to do data-driven decision-making the wrong way. Who's ready to get started? OK. Anti-lesson number one, be impatient. One of the best ways to do data-driven decision-making wrong is to be impatient. When we run A-B tests, we measure the significance of our results using something called a p-value. This gives us a measure of confidence, and it's a standard measure of statistical significance. It is the probability that the result we observe is true even when the null hypothesis is true, or more informally, that the result we observe is merely random chance. When you run an A-B test, you measure p-values looking for it to fall below some threshold, typically 5% or 0.05, as we often de designate it. But the measurement of a p-value is just that, it's a measurement. It doesn't necessarily judge your whole experiment. It's strictly a measure of what you've seen so far. So if on Monday you check the results of your test, you'll see one outcome and one confidence measure with your p-value. Is it good enough yet? Is it statistically significant? Then on Tuesday, we check the results again, you're gonna see different outputs, different results. And now your boss is asking you, is that test done yet? Is it statistically significant? Should we roll it out more? And your data scientist is over muttering in the corner saying, I already gave you the, the minimum sample size in order to make a good test and quit asking me. But there's a better way. Have you got the result you want? <laughs> On that test that you already knew was a good idea? And when you're standing in line at Starbucks and you checked your app after only two days and the results are up and the p-value is below 0.05, declare victory. Roll that test out 100%. You don't have time to deal with all this regression to the mean, statistical, positive outcome nonsense. Send an email out to your whole company announcing your brilliant idea is proven by science. Now, if you're gonna do that, you better move quickly because those results and the p-values can shift fast. And that trumpeting of your latest success in a day might look a little different. How much might it change? Martin Goodson, an expert at a web consultancy that does A-B tests, wrote a paper that showed if you, observe your if you check the results of your tests every single day and stop every positive test as soon as it hits a p-value of 0.05 significance, 80% of winning A-B tests stopped early are false positives, are bogus results. Because being impatient is a great way to do data-driven decision-making wrong. The next way to do data-driven product development totally wrong is to assume sampling is easy. I mean, it takes effort to make sure that the users in your test are representative of your total user community. 
I'm going to tell you a story about this um, from my past that I call Beware the Aids of March. And you can see how well this anti-lesson turned out for me. At a previous company, I was building used car search interfaces for major media brands. We were building an experience and running A-B tests in order to best pair up car shoppers with inventory from dealers. We were trying to improve that conversion, and we had, see, we had observed something interesting. Shoppers who specify price, mileage, or year do better. They're more likely to find a piece of inventory that they're interested in and contact the dealer. So we had a hypothesis. Could we actually nudge shoppers to specify price, mileage, or year and see that same lift in conversion? We did some brainstorming, came up with some ideas, and decided to run an A-B test to find out. We tried out a couple different designs. In one of them, we elevated the price, mileage, and year facets in our search experience to make it more likely that a user would find them. In another, we created a tooltip that actually interrupted the user's flow and suggested that they use these additional terms in their search. We implemented both of these, rolled them out to our production set, measured the results, and we had a winner. With statistical significance, the tooltip showed a 3% lift in conversion. This is a great outcome. We were very happy and rolled that out 100%. But when we rolled it out to 100%, we didn't actually see the results we expected. And we asked ourselves, well, why is that? As we dug into some of the detail, we believe we understood what was happening. You see, we'd taken a shortcut in our test assignment code. This was the summer of 2009, when Internet Explorer had about a 60% US market share in browsers. And their latest version was IE8. My company, like so many others, was sick and tired of trying to maintain compatibility with all the old browsers. And our least favorite was IE6 the software that PC world referred to as the least secure piece of software on the planet. So when we ran into a technical problem assigning users to test variants in IE6, we decided, ah, let's just skip it. We just will ignore those users. As a result, when we ran our test, users on the oldest browsers got ignored. And in our post analysis, we realized this was 20% of users. And even worse, that 20% didn't behave like the other 80%. Users on the oldest browsers were shopped for different cars. They were more price sensitive. In this case, we had tried to run a test, but a distorted sample produced distorted results. We had gone through all the effort to, run, to come up with ideas, implement them, run a test, and in the end, we weren't able to make a good data-driven decision. We were ill-informed because we thought sampling was easy. Our next great way to do bad decisions is to look only at one metric. If there's one thing we know in life, it's that if a little bit is good, a lot is great. If something is worth doing, it is worth overdoing. There are no downsides to that strategy whatsoever. I want to start by illustrating this with a story from Indeed here about our mobile app. And this story we call Indeed Has a Heart. In the Indeed mobile app, users can save a job to come back to later and hopefully apply. We decided to test the icon associated with the save job action to change it from a star to a heart. We changed that on the details page and also here on the search results page. We ran our A-B test. And were hearts better than stars? You bet your heart they were. We saw a 16% lift in saves on the search results page. This was a great result. We were excited. We celebrated it. We rolled it out 100%. Everybody loves hearts now. But why stop with that? If you're going to do that, let's make hearts everywhere. <laughs> stars on your Amazon review page? Nope. Hearts. We sent our results to the folks at Google, and in the next release of Gmail, your starred folder is going to become the hearted folder. And we've got a bill in front of the new Texas legislature. Pretty soon, we are all going to be working and living in the lone heart state. It is going to be fantastic. Oh, not so fast. So we saw an improvement in that metric we were tracking, but do hearts help people get jobs? 
A different group did an analysis of long-term behavior of users, looking at how the use of the hearts actually affected the long-term activity. And unfortunately, we didn't see an improvement in long-term behaviors. No discernible improvement in clicks, applies, and hires, which is really a shame because that's our goal. Our goal is not to help people heart jobs. So in that case, by focusing only on one metric, we made a bad data-driven decision. But that principle of looking only at one metric can go well beyond just running A-B tests. You can use this anti-lesson to do damage throughout your whole organization. For example, Indeed has a talented client services team. And that team is focused on talking regularly with our employers, our customers, and highlighting the value that they receive from Indeed. Increasing revenue from existing customers is obviously important to our business. And we thought, maybe if we had a team focused on that, we could do better. So we formed an upsell team, and we measured their results with the dashboard. The concept of the dashboard was pretty simple. We thought, if an upsell team rep contacts a customer, and subsequently the customer increases their spend, we will attribute that to the rep. We will count it as a successful upsell on our dashboard. So we got the program running, and we checked our dashboard, and it's working. We've got lots of upsells happening. This was tens of thousands of dollars of new revenue. We were really excited. And we stepped back and thought, well, if that's happening, why isn't overall revenue moving? Not even in the basket of accounts that we've identified for the upsell team. So we looked more deeply, and we realized that our naive metric of success was only looking at one type of outcome in a contact between a rep and a customer. Sure, sometimes when the rep contacts a customer, the customer increases their spend, but also sometimes their spend is, doesn't change at all, and sometimes their spend goes down. We were only taking into account one of these and not properly measuring the business outcome. And furthermore, when you build a metric on a dashboard to measure people's performance, we were reminded that what you measure is what you motivate. When we talked to the reps, they told us that they were actually less interested in making phone calls to customers that they thought might lower their spend. So we were completely distorting what we were measuring. So we decided to make a change. We redefined success for this team to include all outcomes. We updated our dashboard, and we restarted our experiment. And the good news is, this went really well. We saw a greater diversity of interactions, but not just positive, but also negatives and neutrals. And overall, our upsell team revenue did increase significantly. This led us to continue the experiment and grow the team. So we just saw two examples here where measuring only, looking at only one metric, especially when it's in the, sort of an easily identified feature metric, or maybe it's the first metric we thought of when we were coming up with our ideas can lead to bad data-driven decision-making. But this anti-lesson has a flip side, because you can also get yourself into trouble by looking at all the metrics. For this story, I want to return to our mobile app with a story where we were looking at our application and comparing it to other mobile applications. We noticed a pattern, a growing adoption of an icon that indicated the presence of a menu. These three dashed lines, which became, are commonly known as the hamburger menu. Well, one of our product managers loved the hamburger and decided to steal the idea. So we decided to run a test to see if the hamburger menu improved Indeed's mobile app. We thought that those other companies knew it must be better for them, but is it better for us? Let's take a look at the results. OK, job applications are up. But job clicks are down. That's probably not good. OK, recommended job traffic is up, but job views, we're not sure. So new resumes is up, but return visits is down, and logins is up, and revenue is down, and <sighs> OK. What we realized was we didn't really know what we wanted. We didn't start this test with an expectation and a, or a hypothesis about what the hamburger menu, how it would improve the Indeed mobile app. So when the various metrics came back with the conflicting stories, the conflicting answers, we actually couldn't decide what the next proper step path forward was. 
There was too much noise from too many metrics. And in this case, we ended up leaving this test running for a long, long time, hoping that more data would bring forth a clear answer. It didn't. We ended up with discussions and emails and meetings about, oh my god, we have to do something about the hamburger test, and how long has the hamburger test been running? And in the end, because we didn't have any evidence that this was an improvement, we turned it off. So today, the Indeed mobile app doesn't have a hamburger menu. Because we didn't start with a clear goal of what we wanted to do, and because we tried to look at all the metrics, we failed at making a good data-driven decision. Next, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Katen, who's going to come up and share with us some other very exciting ways to make bad decisions. Katen? Hi, my name is Katen. I'm an engineering manager here at Indeed. And like Tom, I'm terrible at making data-driven decisions, and I also help people get jobs. Anti-lesson number four, a great way to screw up your data-driven decisions, is to be sloppy with your analysis. Now, we build software products, and when we do that, we engineer our features rigorously. We have a lot of tools and a lot of processes that we employ to make sure that these features we are delivering to job seekers are rock solid and high quality. We produce a specification. We check our code into source control. We conduct code reviews where we review each other's work. We use automated tests and manual QA to ensure correctness. And then after we deploy, we use metrics and monitors to ensure that the software is operating as we expect it to. But with analysis, eh, you know, we don't really do that. Because a bad analysis won't take down Indeed.com. And there are 200 million job seekers who don't care about our sales projections. So we don't try as hard with analysis code. In fact, in many cases, we don't even really consider it code at all. Not trying as hard means we don't have a specification, we don't employ source control, we don't conduct code reviews, we don't use automated tests, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We just don't have time for that. That almost bit us in a story about the Dubliners. Indeed reports on economic trends. Because we are the number one job site in the world, we have access to a wealth of data on jobs that employers are trying to fill. We also have a very large number of job seekers who tell us what they're looking for with their search terms and what they're interested in based on what they click on and what they apply to. One interesting trend we saw was that South Carolinians wanted to move to Dublin. That was pretty interesting. This was a trend worth reporting on. But we weren't sure which Dublin. Just to the north, there's a Dublin, North Carolina. Just to the south, G Dublin, Georgia. There's a Dublin, Ohio, a Dublin, Missouri. There's even a Dublin in Texas, the home of Dr. Pepper. So maybe that's the one that they had in mind. No, the other one. Apparently, a ton of South Carolinians wanted to move to Dublin, Ireland. But that wasn't the case. We had an incorrect IP location mapping. All of the job seekers that used to be, that looked like they were interested in Dublin, we thought their IPs were based in South Carolina. But those IP blocks had gotten reallocated to London, which was the much more normal but much less interesting story that some people in London were interested in moving to Dublin. This was a minor error that we caught before publication in one of our publications. We caught it in time. It wasn't a big deal. But there are worse things that can happen. And that brings us to the story of growth and debt. There was a paper called Growth in a Time of Debt that was published by the very well-respected economists Carmen Reinhart and Kenneth Rogoff in 2010. Now, you may recall 2010 was a very challenging time in the economy all around the world in many countries. This research was very interesting to policymakers and governments around the world. There was a key finding that public debt greater than 90% of GDP leads to slower economic growth. In their research, these two economists discovered that there was some kind of discontinuity. As soon as your public debt exceeded 90% of GDP, growth slowed considerably. Now, governments made policy based on this. They were desperate for answers. So they made a lot of decisions about taxation. They made a lot of decisions about spending, affecting hundreds of billions, possibly even trillions of dollars, and tens of millions, probably hundreds of millions of people were affected by the policies that they made. 
there was just one really tiny little problem with it. And that is that four is not the same as nine. In the analysis that they did in Excel, Reinhardt and Rogoff thought they were computing trends for 20 different countries. And so they tried to average 20 different countries. But through a simple typing error, they only averaged 15. They went from cells L30, L cell L30 to L44 instead of all the way to L49. There were five countries worth of data that were excluded from their analysis. And so they miscomputed the average of 15 countries rather than 20 countries. Now, what's really significant here is that fixing the error eliminated the effect. Simply correcting that 44 to 49 meant that 90% threshold dissolved. It disappeared. There was no effect at all that they said that was there. This type of error also crops up in a story about genetic mutation. 20% of genetics papers have Excel errors, which was revealed in a study earlier this year. So, for instance, the string sept2 to a geneticist is septin2. It refers to the section of DNA that codes for production of that protein. However, sept2 to Excel is the number 42,615. Now, if you use Excel and use formulas in Excel, you know that some of these numerical formulas, they will ignore string values. So if, the, if you have the string sept2 in an average computation, in a sum computation, well, it's going to get ignored. It might get counted as a zero or what have you. If it's counted as the number 42,615, well, just imagine what that does to your results. <laughs> so does your company use spreadsheets? Is anybody in this room familiar with this obscure tool that I'm talking about that's only used in a couple of minor, highly specialized niches? Well, how do you know they're correct? These formulas, these are code. Are you doing code reviews? Are you doing QA? Do you have a specification? These problems are going to crop up, and you're making decisions based on this. This cropped up in a different way in our story of underspending advertisers. There were employer budgets that ran out before the end of the day. Budgets that controlled the display of job advertisements on Indeed's search results page. So, as a result, no evening job seekers saw the jobs. We thought this was a missed opportunity for job seekers, for employers, and for Indeed. How big was this missed opportunity? Well, we decided to do some research, and we prototyped a product to help employers help people get jobs. We came up with this missed clicks report. We would look at how many clicks the employer received during the course of a day. Let's say 1,260. If they ran out of budget at about 8 p.m., we would project and we would say, well, if you funded your budget through the whole day, you'd get another 260 clicks, which was a 20% improvement. That's a pretty big improvement. 260 clicks for Indeed's type of product, that's one or two qualified hires. So if increasing your budget could drive results in your hiring process like that, that's a big, big result. Now, unlike the other errors, we did not do the math wrong here. Our math here was perfect. The thing is, though, the math rested on a certain assumption. When we said they missed 260 clicks, we assumed that traffic through the day was uniform. But of course, that's not true. Traffic doesn't look like this flat line. Traffic looks a lot more like this. So instead of being able to boost clicks by 20%, or 260, it was actually only 100 clicks, or 8%. All of our math was correct, but we didn't have a specification. And therefore, we didn't have a correct specification. We made an incorrect assumption, we had a naive analysis, and so we made a bad recommendation. Anti-lesson number five, only look for expected outcomes. Early in Indeed's history, one problem that we saw frequently was zero results pages from misspelled locations. Job seekers would type the name of a location, but they would leave out, say, an N, or they would transpose letters or something like that. We would be unable to match the location they gave us to a location in our database, and thus we'd be unable to match to any jobs, because there are no jobs in Minneapolis with one N. We looked at our homepage, and we decided to do the same thing that many other sites had done. We implemented an autocomplete. 
The job seeker would type the first few characters of the desired location. We would look up in our location database locations that started with those characters, and we would present them for the job seeker. The job seeker would select the location they had in mind, the form would submit, and they would go to a search results page that had jobs for a true location instead of a misspelled location. Our goal with this test was pretty straightforward. We wanted fewer zero results pages and more job clicks. And that's exactly what we got. Zero results pages went down by 2.7%. Job clicks went up by 8%. So that was pretty successful. And then as a nice bonus, ad revenue went up by 1,410%. That was very nice. It was a great <laughs> success. Hold on a minute. 1,410%. That's huge. I like money. I've got three kids. I need a lot of it. But 1,410% was way more, way more than we expected to happen. And it was out of proportion with the other results. You look at this homepage where we implemented the autocomplete. There are no ads here. This is not a revenue generating page. That's the next page, the search engine results page. But we didn't implement autocomplete here. What was happening? We dug into the implementation. Job seeker types a few letters. We show the list of terms. Job seeker clicks on the selection. We submit the form, show the search results. But we realized, you know, job seekers didn't necessarily know that we were submitting the form. So they would try to click on the Find Jobs button. Now, something about Indeed is that we take a lot of pride in the performance of our search site. We search millions and millions of jobs very, very rapidly. In fact, we search them so fast that by the time the job seeker navigated their cursor to the blue Find Jobs button and clicked, we had replaced the page. They were no longer on the home page because we auto-submitted the form. Instead, their click landed right there on the ad. <laughs> that explains the 1,410% increase in ad revenue. It's not that job seekers loved our ads. They wanted to find jobs, but it was so fast that an ad landed where they intended to click. We went back to our implementation, and we made a simple fix. We just didn't auto-submit the form. Instead, we completed the text within the where box, and then we made them click the blue Find Jobs button to actually submit the search. That wasn't a big deal, because that's what most of them wanted to do anyway. After the fix, ad revenue was much more in line with what we expected. It was much more reasonable. The problem here was there was a treatment on the home page with a particular feature and a particular expected set of results. There was an effect on the search page with a completely different unintended effect. To be honest, we actually caught this by luck. We didn't have processes and systems in place at that time to discover these unintended effects. So we actually got lucky because somebody's uh, eagle eye spotted this effect. Anti-lesson number six is to look at metrics, but not stories. My t-shirt and Tom's t-shirt and the t-shirts of many people here say, I help people get jobs. Well, how do I know if people get jobs? One of Indeed's core businesses is sending people to other sites. And even when we send people to other sites and don't know if they applied, we're also not integrated into hiring systems. So we don't know if they actually hired the person. I need employers to tell me if somebody got hired. Now, a gr rapidly growing part of Indeed's business is Indeed for employers, where employers can post jobs, receive applicants, and pro process those candidates. One of the things that they can do here is they can mark these candidates as hired. So in at least some of the cases, we know whether somebody got hired. So we've got some data points. This is one of Indeed's fastest growing parts of our business. It has a tremendous amount of revenue. It's been hugely successful. In fact, it was so successful that one employer hired 4,500 people in 45 minutes. That is a tremendous rate. Indeed cures unemployment. <laughs> Nope. You didn't see that, and that's not just because nobody reads newspapers. It's because it didn't happen. The effect was illusory. See, accurate recording of outcomes helps us. Indeed has a deep interest in knowing whether we hired people. It doesn't help employers. 
they don't have an interest in tracking their outcomes in our system because it doesn't really tie to anything real that they do. They don't really care about using the product right according to our idea of what it means to use the product right. An employer sees this long list of applicants that they're going to reject and they just want it to go away. And in this particular case, for whatever reason, the employer decided the best way to make them all go away was to mark them all as hired. There's no user story here because the user doesn't care. This was our story that we were trying to impose on the user, but it didn't help them achieve any outcome that mattered to themselves. We had the right metrics, but we were putting it together with the wrong story, and so we arrived at the wrong conclusion. Now there's a part deux to this anti-lesson, and that is to favor story over metrics. Stories are seductive. Story is one of the oldest forms of art. Even incorrect stories are seductive. Take, for example, your taste buds. We've all seen the taste bud map. It looks like this. It tells us that at the back of your tongue, you taste bitter flavors. At the sides of your tongue, you taste sour flavors. Towards the front, you taste salty flavors. And then the tip of your tongue, perfectly positioned for lollipops, is where you taste the sweet flavors. Here's the thing. This is totally wrong. You taste all flavors all over your tongue. The back of your tongue, the front of your tongue, the sides of your tongue, they all taste sweet and salty and sour. That's not the most interesting thing about this, though, to me. The most interesting thing about this is every single bite you eat proves it's wrong. When you have breakfast, you taste the sweet flavors and the salty flavors all over your tongue. When you have second breakfast, you taste the sweet flavors and the salty flavors all over your tongue. Lunch, tea, dinner, dessert, midnight snack, Every bite you eat, one of the most sensual experiences of being alive, tells you, I'm tasting these flavors all over my tongue, and yet people still believe in this taste bud map. More relevantly to Indeed's business is a story of job alerts. Indeed emails relevant job listings to job seekers who sign up for job alerts. We match the jobs they're interested, and we send them by email every day. This saves them the trouble of coming to the website every day and running the same search. Now, email is a mature medium, and success for email is well understood. We know all about what makes a successful email product. New subscriptions are good. Email opens are good. Clicking on stuff in the email is good. And unsubscriptions, those are bad. The green things are things we want to have happen. The red thing is something we want to avoid. Cool, very well understood. But my t-shirt does not say, I help people get emails. My t-shirt says, I help people get jobs. So what does job seeker success look like? Let's take a look at that flow. Step one, search for jobs. A job seeker comes to Indeed, types in some keywords, types in a location, searches for jobs. They like what they see, and they sign up for these alerts to receive them in email every day. They look at the alerts every day. They see some interesting jobs. They click on them. Step four, some of these jobs are particularly interesting. They seem really compelling, so they apply to some jobs. Send in their application, send in a cover letter. Step five, they get a job. Fantastic, the employer got a hire, the job seeker got a job, indeed succeeded in its mission. This is great, but it's also not the end of the story. Step six, unsubscribe from emails. People with new jobs, they don't need job alerts. We've done our job. They don't want to keep getting these jobs. They're happy with what they've gotten. We have succeeded for them. But the problem is the standard story for email fails here. If we optimized for subscriptions and opens and clicks only, and we tried as much as we could to deter unsubscriptions, we would be misaligned with our core mission of helping people get jobs. We would be optimizing for the wrong thing. The story here doesn't match up with what we want to do. I also want to go back to a story that Tom was talking about, of light and dark. Tom was telling you about the Hawthorne Works, a factory where they adjusted environmental conditions and saw an increase, though temporary, in productivity. This led to the Hawthorne effect. Now, this is a persuasive story. It makes a lot of sense. We think about it. It lines up with our understanding of human behavior. It lines up with our need for stimulation to keep a boring job interesting. This makes a lot of sense. It's been very persuasive and very convincing. But the original study was flawed. 
two economists went back to the original data, including one of the authors of Freakonomics. They studied the original data and they came away with a somewhat different conclusion. They said the variance in productivity could be fully accounted for by the fact that the lighting changes were made on Sundays and therefore followed by Mondays where workers' productivity was refreshed by a day off. In other words, they weren't measuring environmental changes at all. They were measuring the effect of a day of rest. Of course your productivity is going to be refreshed by a day of rest. And of course, as the week progresses, it's going to regress to its mean. The Hawthorne effect that everybody knows and everybody invokes actually was illusory. We con people with stories. That's how cons make their marks. But we also con ourselves with stories. And that leads to my final lesson for you, which is to believe in yourself. <laughs> Believing in yourself can be a good thing. For instance, my startup will succeed. There were two gentlemen who believed that story 12 years ago, and that's why I'm here in front of you in this wonderful building telling you about these things. Often, though, it's bad. I'd never fall for a scam like that. Somebody who says something like that is probably a perfect mark. I knew it all along. That's the ego-protecting lie we tell ourselves that inhibits growth and learning. I'm too smart to make that mistake. You should get your video camera out because whatever that person's going to do next is going to be a doozy. <laughs> the thing is, every story of mistakes is deceptive. We tell stories with 20-20 hindsight. If you look back at what happens in those situations, somebody does something. They did it wrong. Somebody gets suspicious. They get some inkling that something isn't quite right. They research it. They investigate it. They discover what went wrong. They figure out what should have happened instead. And then they package it up into a neat story for your consumption. When you came to this talk this evening, you were primed. You knew you were going to hear stories of mistakes and errors. Each one of these stories that Tom and I told you, you knew there was some kind of catch. You knew that it wasn't as good as it sounded. But the thing is, when we live the story, we live in the fog. We lack this clarity. You won't think you're making a mistake when you're making a mistake. That's how you end up making a mistake. So search your past for mistakes, or you could search your email outbox for mistakes. Painful, embarrassing mistakes. If you don't find any, you're exceptional. Or maybe you just think you are, because there are really only two possibilities. Either you're making mistakes you find, or you're making mistakes you don't find. There's no third option. So how do you defend against mistakes? The first step is admitting you have a problem, although that kind of understates it. There are at least 174 cognitive biases, and that's just one class of way to make mistakes. Data can help you make better decisions. It's an invaluable tool for making decisions. Or you can confidently make bad decisions because you interpreted the data wrong, and you point out and you say, look, the data show that I'm the handsomest man in this room. Data can't make you a better decision maker, though. If you take good data and a bad decision maker, it's going to yield a bad decision. Our anti-lessons teach you how to use data badly. If you do the opposite, you'll do better. So lesson one, be patient. It takes time to accumulate a sufficient set of results that you can draw trustworthy conclusions from. If you rush through it, you're not going to be able to trust the conclusions. They may not resemble what you actually get. Lesson two, sampling is hard. You're looking at this broad population of users or customers, and you're choosing a subset of them. And you're hoping that that subset resembles the greater population in every meaningful respect. But it's really easy to choose a subset that is in some way different from the broader population. Lesson three, focus on a few carefully chosen metrics. If you only look at one metric, you're going to have a distorted point of view. You're going to optimize for one thing, at the expense of important things that you're not paying attention to. But on the other hand, if you look at lots of metrics, if you're not careful in choosing which metrics you're actually paying attention to, you'll get arrows pointing in lots of different directions. You will be paralyzed in your analysis by an overwhelming amount of contradictory data. Lesson four, be rigorous with your analysis. We're very careful with the features we build and deploy. We need to be equally careful with the the analysis that we conduct. We're making some really significant decisions based on these analyses. And it doesn't matter how good your feature is, 
if your analysis is incorrect. Lesson five, watch out for side effects. Every change that we make has an intent. It has a primary effect that we're trying to cause. But there's always the risk of side effects, unintended consequences. It's easy to understand why a negative unintended consequence is bad, but even something that seems like a positive unintended consequence should still be understood because it might not be as positive as it seems. So you need to build tools and processes that catch unintended consequences as well as the intended ones. Lesson six, use metrics and stories. If you only use metrics, you may not fully understand what's happening and you may draw the wrong conclusions. But if you only use stories, your story may not actually resemble the reality. You need the metrics to anchor the story and the story to give meaning to the metrics. Lesson seven, plan for fallibility. We're all human beings. Data is objective, but the data gets fed into imperfect processing machines. We have errors in judgment, we have errors in understanding, we have errors in information. So you need to plan for human beings making mistakes even when they have all the data. We want you to learn from our mistakes. That's why we're sharing them with you. And be prepared for your own because you're going to make them. Thank you.